Welcome to church tonight. Good to see all of you here. And uh, trust you've had a good day today and, and, and a great week. And we thank God for his blessings. And Brother Mitch is going to come and lead our service and open our service tonight uh, with, with a song, page 319, 319 in your hymn book, Set My Soul Afire. That would be a great prayer for all of us tonight as we sing that together. Stand with me if you would. 319. together dear lord i pray that you'd set our soul on fire and as the song says lord for thy holy word and lord set our soul of fire for the lost in sin and set our soul on fire for uh, just our daily walk with you our daily life and lord it is far too long we've wandered in this day of strife and and uh lord we know nothing else matters but to live for thee and i pray that you'd impress upon our hearts, the, the truth of that song tonight, set us on fire. Amen. And Spirit of God, we, we ask that you do that through your word and, 
and um, and Lord stir us and and flutter in our heart, and um, and I pray that you'd revive us again. That thy people may rejoice in thee. Bless all the children tonight, spread across uh, this church, upstairs, downstairs, out across uh, this church plant. I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll bless everyone who teaches and and encourages and sings and preaches tonight to these children and teenagers. I pray you bless the children, bless the music tonight in here, our congregational singing, bless the special, and um, bless, Lord, the bus routes, and uh, give safety. Give us a great day Sunday. I pray, Lord, for a great day this Sunday in Sunday school and church, and Lord, I pray you bless Brother Green as he prepares to come. I know he's excited to be here. I pray, Lord, we'd have a full house, a full choir, uh, full classes, and uh, full pews. I pray we'll find family and friends to come and be with us. And I pray you bless in the preaching and in the um, altar calls. I pray that you'll give us souls on that day and even tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated and uh, welcome again uh, to church this evening. This is prayer meeting night, and uh, you should have gotten a, a prayer list when you came in this evening, and um, uh, we'll look at that in, throughout the, the service tonight, but um, we do have some names to add to that since we've put all of this together, but I, I do want you to note, uh, friend and family day this Sunday, it's going to be a great day. You don't want to miss it, and um, Brother Green uh, we'll be here. We'll have a combined Sunday school from teens through adults. All the teen and uh, adult Sunday school classes will meet in the auditorium here. Brother Green will challenge us on Sunday in Sunday school preaching service Sunday night again. And uh, so if you're in the choir, plan to be here. Uh, if, if you're uh, maybe you've been lax a little bit in Sunday school, plan to be here. Maybe uh, you've just been missing some on Sunday night. Plan to be here Sunday morning. And uh, bring someone with you and just tell them, hey, it's Family Friends Day. We'll have a great time out in the gym after church. Have a big fall festival plan. Thank all of you that have, that have volunteered to help with that. And uh, we'll have uh, games set up like a big gym full of carnival games and candy and things for the kids. And um, it will be a nice, safe place for them. To, to have a, a great day after. Last year, a little boy came up to me with a hot dog in his hand. He said, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> and, um, and I pray that would be true this year. And uh, we'll have hot dogs for all the kids and all of you that come on Sunday. We'll, we'll have a great day. And let's just max it out for the glory of God this Sunday. And uh, Brother Seth's going to come now. And, uh, of course, I've already made that announcement, but... Uh, but I did want to just emphasize those things, and, and I hope you'll be a part of it. Amen. 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 That's the big announcement this week, and hopefully you're praying about that and looking with anticipation of what God can do on this Sunday. Yeah. I also want to remind you as we're uh, going out of the month of October, it's hard to believe. It's been a great month uh, here at RBT. Also looking ahead to November, we have many things planned as we will be finishing out the year before long. And uh, looking ahead also at Time Change Sunday, I want to remind you of that. And uh, many other things will be coming uh, shortly, especially as we head into the, the, the Christmas season and all of that. And the children did a great job Sunday night, didn't they? Yeah, that was yeah. a blessing and an encouragement. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm thankful for that ministry of Miss Brenda. And she can get those kids singing, can't she? And okay, let's look at a missionary letter here tonight as we head into our missions prayer time. Uh, you'll see those missionaries mentioned there in your bulletin. Also with our Preacher of the Week, a uh, pastor will come in just a moment and uh, continue with the missions prayer time. Uh, the, the letter tonight is from the Odysons, uh, reaching the people of Papua New Guinea. This was written in September of this year. And he's speaking of a building project uh, as well, but also building people. This is much of the time since the last... Update has been spent in milling wood for two new buildings, a large classroom and a kitchen. Each of these buildings will be used to minister uh, more fully within the context of our church, housing, passing visitors, and having places to instruct Christians as they mature in their faith. Uh, felling trees and milling each piece of timber is a time-consuming 
but it provides an avenue to interact with people who otherwise keep their distance. News that jobs are available quickly produces an unlikely crew. Despite uh, friction and, uh, it says even theft, it's a healthy exercise in bearing a clear Christian testimony and heartily sharing the gospel with men as we work side by side. Our family traveled to a town named Wau. Uh, it lies within a fertile valley of the interior highlands of Papua New Guinea. For more than 90 years, tons of gold ore has been mined from its mountain slopes and river's edge. Wow. Nestled between the, beside excuse me, the gigantic airstrip is the Wau Baptist Bible School. The school was founded in the early 1960s and has trained an army of men and their families in the ministry ever since. He mentions those that lead that ministry and how he was able to come and help with a study of minor prophets in the Old Testament. Additionally, invitations by local churches to preach or teach each week were a cherished opportunity for Cherith and me. Uh, the fellowship on the Bible school campus along with the churches was, was deeply refreshing and we felt knitted together with families there. He does mention the, some health concerns that he had uh, for heart discomfort and palpitations. And so while they were out and about, they had some health checks that were done. Uh, but the doctor gave a, a positive opinion there of what was going on. And it says also a dentist's office also brightened everyone's cheerful smiles. And it says we have uh, finished the kitchen that was mentioned above. And then also he closes out his letter by saying we expanded our Sunday school by adding two new classes for our youth. So we have four split classes, adults, children, and two for the youth, men, and ladies. The young men have enthusiastically seized the kitchen as their Sunday school room, the one they're building. Next, we will mill enough wood so the classroom can also be completed and utilized for new programs in the coming months. In his service... Uh, Jason, Cherith, Grace, Melody, Hannah, and Josiah Otteson. And they're, they're our missionaries to Papua New Guinea. And so make sure we're, we're praying for the Otisons and pastors will come as we continue with our missions prayer time. Amen. Well, the Otisons are great missionaries. They really are. And um, thank God for them. And uh, they've done a great work among uh, the Kamiya people. And um, it's amazing translating uh, the scriptures, and they had to begin with a primer and an alphabet that they didn't even have. And uh, think about that, and just sounding out the the sounds, and it yeah. really was very, very uh, element, really below elementary uh, where they began. But God's blessed them in a great way, hey. and uh, continue to pray for the Audisons, the palace there in Brazil, and then Brother Gerald Pauley in Canada. And um, we do have these flyers out in the gym or out in the foyer tonight, and uh, we'll be sending these home too with the kids. I, I, I want to encourage you to take one or two or three or four or five and give them to somebody and invite them. Look them in their eyeball and invite them to church Sunday and do your best to get them here. And uh, we will have a a pumpkin patch for the kids out here, and um, Brother Seth's had a pumpkin patch this year, and uh, pr pretty good pumpkin patch, but we'll have pumpkins all over miraculously. They'll grow from Saturday night into Sunday morning out here. We've got 100 pumpkins we'll be putting out there for the kids, and they can go out and pick their own pumpkin after church. Um, so pray, pray about all that. Um, be a part of reaching people, reaching people. Uh, keep praying for these on the sick list. We'll share more about them later at the end of the service tonight. Um, do pray for the family of Charles Smith. I helped Pastor Swore yesterday in, in, uh, in Brother Smith's funeral service there in Elkview. And uh, pray for his wife, Linda, their son, Wayne, and daughter, Lynn, and pray for their extended family Charles was a wonderful man he and I got saved the same month February 1972 at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church and we were baptized together in early March the first Sunday of March of 72 in Blue Creek but it was Brown Creek that day <laughs> it's snowy and and uh, they dropped Brother Smith someone slipped and he was baptized twice as well as the deacon and the pastor 
And, um, but they, they got back on their feet, and I, I wasn't real sure of myself after I watched that happen, but we, it all got done, amen, to the glory of God. And um, but we love Brother Smith, good man of God, faithful, faithful, faithful. And uh, went to heaven and um, pray for his family. And uh, pray for our missions ministry, our faith promise. And, uh, of course, we give 10% of our general fund to missions. And on top of that, we do our faith promise mission giving. Pray for all of our staff, deacons, and trustees. Pray for our third through the sixth grade Sunday school class. And uh, Peggy and Liz and Rebecca teach that class. And our Preacher of the Week's uh, evangelist, Dr. Roger Green. And uh, so uh, pray for these. All right. And uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem tonight. Pray for our troops in the area. Pray for Israel and all that's happening in the Middle East at this time. All right? And uh, Brother Kenny Asbury, would you stand and lead us to God in prayer? Pray for these missionaries and uh, pray for these folks that are hurting. Amen. Mm. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Amen. Brother Kenny, thank you. Thank you for that good prayer. Keep praying for these. They depend on us. And we'll look at uh, more names here at the end of the service uh, tonight. 
And uh, Brother Mitch is going to come and lead us in a song. Victory in Jesus, I think we know it well. And let's sing our best. Amen. 341, as we stand again. 341. First and last verses. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and he bought On the very last, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day. Song of victory, of victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is due him. He me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Thank you much. You made me see that.
Well, there's nothing like having some teenagers around to add some life to a service. Amen? Amen. Hopefully that livens you up a bit tonight. <laughs> Amen. Wasn't that a blessing? Yes, sir. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Wonderful. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. We've been uh, studying the, uh, the life of David. And tonight I want to begin a, a couple of weeks on this, this subject, the, the high cost of low living. And that was true in David's life throughout the Bible. It was true, certainly true in David's life. It cost him a high cost. And it'll cost us a high cost. Low living will always cost you. And... Um, David found that out, found it out the hard way. In review, if you remember last week, chapter 11, um, David, of course, it says it was the time when kings went forth to battle and um, David's forces went out to fight. And David, though, in verse 1 of chapter 11, stayed and tarried in Jerusalem. We don't know why, but he, he decided not to go and be with his troops. Joab, of course, was an able leader, but, um, but David did not go. Everything rises and falls on leadership. We know that, and leaders lead, and David was not leading here, and he found himself where he should not have been, tearing back in Jerusalem. Because of that, he walked out on the rooftop one evening and saw Bathsheba there bathing. And um, We said last week, you know, he was at fault, she was at fault. It takes two to commit adultery, and, and uh, both of them were complicit. And, and uh, notice in verse 2 it says, He saw a woman washing herself. Her name we know later was Bathsheba. He saw her. He sent for her in verse 3. David sent and inquired after the woman. And then notice he sinned with her in verse 4. The Bible says he lay with her, and lo and behold, not long after that, she found that she was with child of the king. And... Um, the only problem was he was married and she was married and uh, God calls that sin and adultery. And so um, David sends out into the battlefield and brings her husband Uriah back uh, for a furlough. And, um, and he calls him in and just kind of uh, falsely acts like he's interested in how things are going. And he asked Uriah, he said, how's the battle going? How's Joab the general? How... How are you feeling? How's your family? And I know it's been a hard time and I, I want you to take some leave and spend time with your wife. And we know that Uriah would not do that. He was so loyal uh, to the troops. He said, how can I come and spend a weekend with my wife uh, when my fellow soldiers are out on the battlefield? Uh, just like when, when the tribes of, uh, uh, of uh, Reuben and Gad wanted to stay on the east side of the Jordan and uh, Moses said, how, how can you stay here when your brethren go, go to battle? And, um, but anyway, uh, Uriah said, I, I, can't, I can't do that. I, I appreciate it, O king. And it uh, wouldn't be right to Joab. It wouldn't be right for me. It wouldn't be right for you. It wouldn't represent Israel. And, and uh, the valiant men are out there on the battlefield. I'm not, I can't do it. And, and, um, and, and so he, sent, he, he reiterated his, um, his offer, he said, look, I want you to go spend time with your wife. And um, he, he wouldn't do it. He sent, sent him home with some gifts. And he slept at the door of the, uh, of the castle there, the palace. And then he got him drunk. And, and still, he, even in his drunkenness, he, he would not be disloyal uh, as a soldier. And so uh, David writes a letter to Joab, his general. And in that letter, uh, he, he tells Joab... Uh, to put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle where the valiant men would fight. And he says, uh, I want you to, uh, in the midst of the battle, in the heat of the battle, I want you to pull the men back uh, to where um, Uriah would be overcome, outnumbered, even though he was a brave man and a great warrior, he could not fight you know, a whole company of men. And, and so that's what they did. The ironic thing was that, that David sent this letter with Joab uh, or sent this letter to Joab with Uriah, knowing that Uriah would not read it. Isn't that something? That had to have pricked the heart of David. 
that, he, that, that Uriah was carrying his death sentence. And he knew that he wouldn't open it and read it. He had that much confidence in him. But one sin leads to another, we said, and, and uh, enticement, lust, and sin, and death. And, and, um, and, and so he would carry that. Joab would read the letter, act like he was interested in things. And, and of course, they, uh, their, their plot was uh, played out on the battlefield, and Uriah was killed. News came back from the battle to, uh, to David through the servant, through the messenger. We come to chapter 11. And um, in verse 18, then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. And in verse 21, he says, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the servant went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. Down in verse um, um, 24, he, they concoct this story. And, and in the midst of the story, at the end of the story, he he just kind of adds on, oh, and Uriah is dead also. That's really the reason he came was to tell him that Uriah was dead. And so uh, it says in verse 25, David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. It, 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 as we read this kind of a flippant attitude that David has about death and, and putting people to death, you know, uh, you know, one sin leads to another sin and, and you get calloused and harder and harder and, uh, and we can see how sin leads to death and hardness of heart. And, uh, and David just makes this statement and he says, well, you, you know, you tell Joab, the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city. Overthrow it. Encourage him. All the while David's thinking in the back of his heart, now I'm going to marry her. I'm going to send for her. I'm going to marry her. She's carrying my baby. In verse 26, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house. I mean, it couldn't have gone any better. Couldn't have gone any better. As far as David and Joab were concerned, these were hardened warriors. These were soldiers. David knew better. Joab knew better. They all knew better. Bathsheba knew better. But it couldn't have gone any better. Man, I mean, hey, no one knows about it. Their plot has been played out and everything seems to be fine. But there was only one problem. Read about it with me. It says in verse 27, when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her, Bathsheba, to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son, David's son. But this thing, it says, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Underline that in your Bible, verse 27. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. People back home didn't know about it. Fellow soldiers probably wondered why, why did we retreat in the middle of the battle. Somehow Uriah didn't get the signal. I don't know how they all did this, but God knew about it. God knew about it. There's something about secret sin and presumptuous sin. Remember when David later, it must have been later, when David would pray, Lord, deliver me from presumptuous sin. I think sometimes as Baptist people, sometimes the criticism that people have of us in believing in the security of the believer, uh, with some people it may be, have some basis. I mean, the fact that we believe that we can be saved and we're saved forever should give us a greater responsibility and obligation to live for Christ and to live holy, righteously, and godly in this present world. Because we are saved forever, we want to please the king. We don't want to presume upon his grace. But sometimes people live that way, and I wonder about their salvation. I, I'm not the judge of all the earth. The judge of all the earth will do right. 
and the judge of all the earth will do righteously. But the secret sins of the believer, God knows. He's not going to look the other way. He's not going to wink at it. Because his dear son died for those sins, right? And so the Bible says the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. For whom the Lord loves, Hebrews 12, 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receives. And the Bible says if you're without chastisement, your bastards are illegitimate and you're not a child of God. And so these people that can just live any way they want to, oh yeah, I'm saved, I'm saved, and live like the world, live like the devil, and, and never seem to have any, any inclination to get it right, never, never, I mean openly or secretly. There's a problem with that. God has a problem with that. If they're really a child of God, God's going to deal with them as a child, right? Well, in chapter 12 and verse 1, and by the way, if you have secret sins in your life, you're walking on thin ice with God. You really are. In chapter 12, verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. Who was Nathan? Nathan was the prophet, a prophet, the prophet of that area. And the, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David. I'm thankful for the prophets of God throughout the Scriptures who were faithful to give the message of God in, in un, un, unbelievably difficult times. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. How would you like to have been Nathan? But it doesn't seem like Nathan was a bit afraid to give the message to the king. And the Lord sent him there and he gives him a message to preach. Just like Jeremiah. God gave Jeremiah object lessons. He gave him um, pottery to break. He gave him a, a girdle to bury, a piece of, uh, uh, of cloth and clothing to bury. And he, he, he gave him, you know, other things there, object lessons and and, um, and God gave him the message. God gave Nathan the message. He gave him a parable to tell. Let's read that parable. Look in verse 1. He said unto him, There were two men in one city. The one was a rich man, it says, the one rich and the other poor. David's listening here. Because he, you know, when the prophet came, the prophet comes to visit him, and he begins to tell him a share with him a parable or a story, David must think, he's got a message from God for me. He knew that. You know, I don't know that Nathan came all the time and, and gave messages from God. And so David did have enough heart for God to listen. So he tells him about a rich man and a poor man. The rich man, verse 2, had exceeding many flocks and herds. He had plenty of livestock. But the poor man had nothing. Look at verse 3. Save one little ewe lamb, one little lamb, a little uh, girl lamb, which he had brought, he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. That little ewe lamb, it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, lay in his bosom, was unto him as a daughter. That poor man, all he had was that little ewe, and he loved it. He fed it, nurtured it, you know, hugged it up and loved it, and and there came a traveler unto the rich man, verse 4, and he spared to take of his own flock, of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Well, immediately, David, David gets it. David, David knows he's telling a story, and, and this story is an illustration of somebody that Nathan knew in the kingdom there close by, and and David was picking up on all that. And David, boy, David's anger just flew all over him. He, he hears this story in verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Little did he know he was describing himself. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, four times. Because he did this thing, because he had no pity. David is nailing his own hide to the wall. So this man had no pity. He ought to be killed. He ought to restore fourfold. It's awful. Nathan said to David, he didn't cut any corners. He didn't dress it up. I think he pointed at him and said, O king, 
You're the man in this story. Thou art the man. You're the man. David, with all of his sin and, and all that he'd done wrong, and, and honestly, he had killed Uriah as if he had struck him with his own sword in his own hand. He was responsible for his death. With all of that, David still had enough sensitivity to God to admit that he'd sinned. And I, think his, I think his repentance was true. King Saul's repentance wasn't. You know, he would say whatever he needed to say to get by, and, and then he'd do it again. There was no true repentance. But no, what did David say when he said, Thou art the man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Look at verse 7. God said, O king, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom. I gave thee the house of Israel. I gave thee the house of Judah. If that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. He said, I, if you'd have stayed right with me, I'd have given you even more. But you're the man in this story. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? I, I believe, as I said Sunday, with all, with all the darkness in our land and all the sin in our land, still encouraging that the preachers by the thousands were preaching the word last Sunday in America. But preachers need to get the prophets spying again in America and point out the sins of the day. We're called to do that. We're called to to preach against the sins of the king. And people cry, separation of church and state. I don't find that in the Bible and I don't find that in the Constitution. Other than the state should stay out of the affairs of the church. And he blisters him with this message. He says, thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite, verse 9. You've killed Uriah with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife. I think in the halls of Congress it'd be good for a Nathan to stand up and, and preach that. And has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword, verse 10, notice God forgave him, but notice the effects and the scars of his sin would remain. The sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me, hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. We know Absalom, Amnon, Tamar. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thus he said, you did it secretly. Thou did it secretly, verse 12. But I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. And immediately, immediately, this came about and came true. Bathsheba came to full term, gave birth to their son. The Bible says the baby was sick for a whole week. David fasted and prayed and asked God to spare his son. But it was, it, it, it was not to be. And the baby passed away. And David with a broken heart. He's praying and fasting. And the servants of the Lord, the Bible says in chapter 12, his servants there in the palace, uh, they didn't want to tell him. They said, who's going to tell him? We don't want to tell him. He, he's so broken already. We don't want to tell him that his baby has died. And, and, uh, and David saw his servants whispering. And the Bible says he discerned that the baby was dead. And he came and asked them. And they said, yes, the baby's died. The Bible says that David got up and washed himself. And he ate. And he worshiped the Lord. And he said this about the baby. And maybe some of you can claim this. And some of you have been there. And like, like, like David said of his little baby, he says, Now he is dead, verse 23, 
Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No. He said, I can't bring him back. But I shall go to him. Amen. What a comfort that is. But he shall not return to me. There are a lot of babies in heaven for a lot of different reasons. And, and we'll leave all that to God. But, and I don't know what form those babies will take, but I believe, I believe the, the silent scream of, of millions of babies that have died through the horrors of abortion since Roe versus Wade. And thank God that finally was put to rest recently. There's still battles to be fought state by state, and I'm glad for every baby and every child that's saved. And, but one day in heaven, the, the, those babies will be represented. I don't know how and what form, but, but they'll be there because they're alive. And the Bible says, can I bring him back again? I can't, but I can go to him. I can go to him. And that's a great comfort. And God in His goodness and His grace would give David and Bathsheba another son. And he would be allowed to live. And his name was Solomon. And we'll learn more about King Solomon in more study later. Let's bow our heads in prayer. The high cost of low living. Remember what God said to David. He said, David, the sword will never depart from your house. David would, with a broken heart for years to come, even after God had forgiven him, and that God would restore him and that God would allow him to be used and lead a great nation and would give him the kingdom. He said, I, I, I'm gonna, I, your kingdom will be forever and the Messiah will sit upon your, your throne one day. But yet, David would visit a grave of that little baby David would visit the grave of Amnon who raped his half-sister Tamar. David would visit the grave of Absalom who died a rebel's death. The sword did not leave his family. But he became known as a man after God's own heart. He wrote most of the Psalms, became a great king. But I think we can identify with David Let's be where we're supposed to be. Let's do what we're supposed to do. Let's, let's trust God for his blessings. And let's not, let's ask God to deliver us from presumptuous sins. Well, that's not that bad. It is bad. Jesus died for it. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sin, God's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know what, what kind of hidden sin you might have in your life tonight. I don't, I don't need you to confess that to me. But you and God know where that is. And God has a way of, of putting his finger right on that. Why don't you meet with God tonight and confess that to a holy God. And get your heart and life clean before the Lord. If you never trust him as your Savior, do it tonight. Do it tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd... Bless this message tonight to our hearts. Lord, we realize that you saw it all and you dealt with it all. You didn't sweep it under the rug and David tried to and we can try to. But Lord, you said be sure your sins will find you out. Be sure. And Lord, I pray that tonight that we'd see the, the effect of high, the high cost of low living. In Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and Ashley's playing a verse of invitation. Maybe tonight you'd like to come. You know, when you preach a message like this, sometimes people, they're reluctant to come. Those people will think, well, I've, I've committed adultery or I've done, you know. That, but there might just be that, what we would call that little sin that you let go. That, that little fox, that, that little fly in the ointment that you've not dealt with. I'll tell you, that thing can become a cancer. It can become a tumor that'll spread. Thank you for joining us today here at Ripley Baptist Temple. And you've stuck around for a reason. What is that reason? Are you a believer that's already accepted the Lord as your Savior? You, maybe you'd like to 
get right with God about something in your life, or maybe you've never accepted Him as your Savior and you have some questions, well, maybe I can answer those for you in just the next couple of minutes. First of all, there's a problem. We're all sinners. Now you probably know what sin is. We do it every day, don't we? We, we always we make mistakes and it's anything that we do, say, or think that's against the Lord. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Wherefore is but one man sinner into the world, so death by sin. We're all sinners. We all do it. So not only is there a problem, but because of that problem, there's a punishment because of our sin. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Now what's that death talking about? It's a terrible place called hell. I know many times we just think of it as a cuss word. But it's a terrible place that if you do not accept the Lord as your Savior, you'll dwell there for all of eternity. But I'm thankful that the, the Bible doesn't end there. This is not just punishment in a lake of fire, but also there's a plan. John 3.16, and you've probably heard it, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That whosoever is you, that whosoever is me. And all we need to do is accept that plan and that person, and then we have a place for all of eternity called heaven. And how do we go about accepting that plan? Well, first, you've got to understand that you're a sinner. Because of your sin, you deserve to go to that terrible place called hell. Then you need to ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and save you. You've stuck around this long. Would you like to pray that prayer with me today? If so, bow with me now at this time and say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And because of my sin, I deserve to go to hell forever. But I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sin. Please forgive me of my sin and save me. Did you just pray that prayer? If you did, contact us. We'd like to encourage you and, and help you in your, in your new walk with Christ. And we're so thankful you joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you again, whether here on live stream or we'd love to have you in person. God bless you and have a wonderful day.